Hello everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us for the latest webinar in the Brodie's Enlightened Thinking series. Um, we're very fortunate today to be joined by Professor Craig Ritchie. Um, Craig is a Professor of Psychiatry of Ageing at the University of Edinburgh, Director of Edinburgh Dementia Prevention and a Director of Brain Health Scotland, which went live this year. Um, before I tell you a bit more about Craig, um, Brodie's journey with Alzheimer's Scotland um, began um, at the start of this year. Um, we asked our colleagues to vote on which charity they would like um, to be our partner for the next three years, and they overwhelmingly chose Alzheimer's Scotland. That let us understand and see how many of our colleagues are touched by, by Alzheimer's and dementia, um, and how important they think it is. Professor Ritchie um, is a leading authority in clinical trials and dementia. <clears throat> His research focuses on early detection of neurodegenerative diseases and the promotion of brain health throughout the life course to mitigate risks for development and progression of brain diseases that lead to dementia. Craig is chair of the Scottish Dementia Research Consortium, chief investigator of the European Prevention of Alzheimer's Dementia Consortium, and the PREVENT Dementia Programme. PREVENT is a project that's a major initiative nationally, which will identify the midlife risks for later life dementia and characterize early changes of neurodegenerative disease through imaging, genetic, cognitive, and biomarker analysis. So what that means to me is work out now what needs to be done in order to stop or reduce later life dementia. So, without further ado, um, I'm going to pass over to Professor Ritchie. Great, well, thanks very, very much, Matt, for the, for the introduction. Thanks also to Dawn and everyone else at Brodie's who's um, um, helped put this together. And also, huge thanks to, to, to the whole company, I guess, for the support uh, of Alzheimer's Scotland um, as your sort of charity of the year. So I think, what, I, what I'd like to do um, over the next sort of 40 minutes, hour or so in, in, in the presentations and also in the, in the, I guess in the conversations with Matt and the, and the Q&A that, 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 that will be part of that, is really give a um, quite a big overview uh, initially on um, this whole you know, clinical area of dementia, uh, which as I'm sure many people on this call uh, will know is, is probably one of the biggest challenges from a medical perspective or a clinical perspective that society faces, notwithstanding, uh, you know, where we are with COVID. I mean, the reality is that, you know, COVID uh, will uh, eventually be managed. It will, it'll, it'll, it'll go over the years ahead. Whereas dementia is, you know, because of the aging population is something that we're going to be living with for generations to come if we weren't to do something very actively uh, to try and prevent it. And I think one of the, um, a good starting point, if you like, for this, for this afternoon's discussion is the World Alzheimer's Report, now five years old, and the, the World Alzheimer's Report 2020 is obviously coming out quite soon. Uh, but this really did illustrate, I think, the extent of dementia as not just a personal uh, challenge and in some cases almost tragedy, but also the impact from societal and an economic perspective that dementia has uh, on not just you know high income countries but possibly um, even more so on low and middle income countries so you can see in this in this cartoon some of the sort of take home figures that you know there's a person with diagnosed with dementia every 3 seconds that um, much of the increase as i mentioned in the numbers of people with dementia in the years ahead uh, will be in low and middle income countries up to maybe uh, just over 2 thirds of people uh, and economically, if, if dementia and the cost of dementia were, a, were an economy, it would be the 18th largest uh, in the world. So you can just see that the scale of this issue is something that probably touches many of us personally, but obviously clearly affects society as a whole uh, on, at a global level. Um, and this really just re-emphasizes in some ways this um, disproportionate impact on uh, low and middle income countries. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about this later about how uh, collectively we can maybe help to mitigate through prevention strategies, through improving brain health. 
and not just in high income countries, but also in low middle income countries, which may in fact have some greater opportunities to do so uh, than we do um, here in Scotland and elsewhere. Uh, and the final slide I'll show before I you know, go into the, the meat of the conversation is really what I think most people will recognize quite, quite the quite straightforward concept that prevention is get better than cure. Now, we know that of all the risk factors for dementia, and we'll talk about some of those during the course of the afternoon, the number one risk factor is age. And at a doubling of incidence of, um, of Alzheimer's dementia or, or most other dementias every five years from the age of 60 onwards. So this very simple figure cartoon, if you like, that I published in Lancet Psychiatry a few years ago, just simply moved the curve to the right and said, if we could delay the onset in every single individual, uh, the onset of a dementia syndrome by five years, then we'd have a substantial impact on the numbers of people at any age and probably in any society who actually have a diagnosis of dementia. Now that obviously makes the assumption that you know people will probably die at a sort of a, uh, you know we're not going to extend uh, you know the, the the length of time that people are alive, but what we do is we ensure that they they live as long as possible with very healthy brains and are cognitively able and functionally able during that. So as Matt was saying, I think it'd be nice to split this um, presentation into two parts. The first is I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the science that we've been doing, which has provided really quite um, you know, irrefutable evidence that the diseases that lead to dementia in late life have a genesis in midlife at least. Um, and Matt mentioned the PREVENT study. Uh, I know I won't necessarily show you data from that. All my slides and all of my thinking and all of the things I'm gonna say are very much based on the observations we've been, made, we've been making from some of the highest quality uh, research studies uh, anywhere on the planet at the moment. Um, I'll also talk a little bit as I'm talking about disease before dementia, about why I, I actually have a, a kind of a, a slight um, hang up almost with the term dementia and in some ways how using that term and thinking about neurodegenerative diseases um, through the prism, if you like, of the dementia syndrome might actually be holding us back a little bit. But, but we'll, we'll discuss that. I'm sure that might come up in the Q&A as well. Then what I'd like to do is, as well as you know, all this wonderful science and all these great discoveries and uncovering certain things about how the brain works and doesn't work and you know, how that might lead to dementia, what's more important, vastly more important than any scientific publication or output, is how do you get that research into practice? And that's why in the second half of this afternoon, uh, I want to talk about Brain Health Scotland and about how we've taken, with Scottish Government, with Alzheimer's Scotland, um, a, a global first, a national initiative to take all of this research evidence and really quickly put it into practice to make sure that as few people in Scotland get dementia in the years ahead uh, as is possible. So, um, neurodegeneration and dementia. So, I'm going to use the term neurodegeneration a lot more than I use the term dementia. Neurodegeneration, as the name suggests, is the de degeneration of nerve cells. And there's a series of different diseases or illnesses, Alzheimer's disease being the most common, that lead to nerve cells degenerating and dying. At the end stage of these neurodegenerative processes, the brain fails, if you like, to an extent where symptoms emerge, which we all know or characterize or recognize, I should say, as dementia. So dementia is the end stage of a very severe brain disease um, of a neurodegenerative nature. Now in this slide, I've highlighted this kind of sense of there being a silent period, you know, mild problems, moderate problems, and then severe problems being when the dementia, notice I deliberately don't say symptoms, but problems might be mild where people are maybe, you know, not recognizing faces or a little bit slower understanding new technologies, et cetera, but nothing to the extent you'd ever say that person had a dementia syndrome. Now, the critical thing from this slide though I really want people to take away is this, this deliberate use of the term silent period, because it's only silent if we're not listening properly. And that's what a lot of our research is trying to do, is trying to like, turn up the volume or, 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 or tune us into 
that silent period so we can detect the very early stage of disease. And if, if we all think about things like cancer, you know, oncologists and cancer specialists over the years have been trying to find the earliest stages of breast cancer, cervical cancer, you know, bowel cancer, because it just stands to reason. The sooner you pick up a disease process, the more likely you are to affect its course. Now, the analogy I could use here is that by the time we diagnose somebody with dementia, the disease has spread in effect throughout their brain to the point where trying to reverse the damage that's been caused is is going to be challenging, if not impossible. Whereas if we can detect disease when it's at its earliest stages, then there is great hope that you can maybe at least stop those changes and delay things by five years, as I mentioned, or you could at least, or you might even be able to reverse some of the some of the damage that's been done. So the chap on the left is Alois Alzheimer, uh, who of course, of course is the, 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 the professor that came up with the eponymous syndrome in his name, Alzheimer's disease. And on the right is August D, who is the first patient uh, that was described as having the Alzheimer's pathology, which then you know, characterized uh, the brain disease and the clinical symptoms that she suffered with. She was in her 50s when she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's uh, disease. And these are actually the, 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 the illustrations that Alzheimer made uh, at post-mortem of August D. And these were the kind of things, the, the, the lesions, if you like, that Alzheimer saw through the light microscope uh, in her brain. And what we have here on the left is something we call the amyloid plaque, um, which is a collection outside of the cell of a protein called amyloid beta, and we know so much more now than, you know, than we did even 20, 30 years ago about how this amyloid forms, what drives that formation, what helps it to be cleared. Um, and that's where we target, dare I say, it, a lot of our therapeutic interventions at the moment or our drugs that are being trialed is to try and stop this amyloid from forming into these clumps. On the right, we have what, we're called, what we call neurofibrillary tangles. And these are inside the cell. And these are collections of another protein called tau, T-A-U, which for some reason aggregates inside the cell, it joins together, it clumps together. And the nerve cells really don't like that, mainly because tau is a protein that helps the skeleton inside the cell, the scaffolding inside the cell to stay together. And when tau forms into these clumps, the scaffold breaks down and the nerve cells don't like that. The nerve cells degenerate. And the, the net consequence of that is with these nerve cells not functioning well, they can't send signals to each other. And what this is is obviously a cartoon of what we call a synapse. The two nerve cells, you know, sitting against each other, um, the, electro, uh, the electrical signal passes down one nerve cell, it reaches the end, the terminal bouton, it's called. And when it gets there, it leads to, through, through chemical processes inside the cell leads to the release of something called a neurotransmitter. And there's various neurotransmitters in the brain like dopamine and serotonin and noradrenaline. And that's picked up uh, by the next nerve cell and then it fires a signal as well. So this is how nerve cells talk to each other and that's how the brain in effect works. So what is, as I said earlier, um, and please don't take all this down, I'm not going to be asking questions about this, this later. It's just to illustrate the depth of knowledge that we have about how the brain works and, and, and stops working in, in, in conditions like Alzheimer's disease. So what we have in this cartoon is an illustration on the right side of what happens in health. Uh, we have the healthy neuron. We have this protein you can see here. I don't know if this works, this, this protein here called amyloid precursor protein. And it's like every other protein in the body, it gets cut down, broken down over time by these enzymes, alpha secretase and gamma secretase. And that releases a very short piece of protein, which is very soluble and very easily cleared by the body. In Alzheimer's disease, for some reason, the gamma secretase uh, still does its job but the alpha secretase, the green, stops uh, working in preference to something called beta secretase. This releases a long amyloid fragment, and that's not soluble, and that's what clumps together to form the amyloid plaque. That process of clumping together 
produces free radicals and it produces damage and it's neurotoxic, it's synaptotoxic, the nerve cells don't like it and they stop working so well. And inside the cell, like I said earlier, you have this, pro this, this tau protein which holds the microtubule, the skeleton I described earlier together. If it breaks off and forms these tangles, these clumpings together, then the skeleton breaks down and again, the nerve cell doesn't like it. So we know the biology of Alzheimer's disease. We've known it since 1903. We've known what the targets are and we've spent you know, the last 120 years trying to work out in the lab how these things all interact with each other. And what we've discovered is that there's not just these two processes going on. Eventually, by the time somebody gets Alzheimer's dementia, there are multiple disease processes which are all working together. This end stage, the disease is spread throughout the brain and there's lots of other things going wrong, which means that if you try and just knock down the amyloid process, you're still not gonna cure the person because all these other things have started to happen as well and they don't necessarily stop just because you stop the amyloid. So dementia is a clinical syndrome. And a syndrome is a set of medical signs and symptoms that are correlated with each other and often with a particular disease or disorder. The word derives from the Greek, and I can't say that because I'm not, you know, I'm not, I don't speak Greek. But in, in effect, a syndrome is a collection or a concurrence of signs and symptoms. And Alzheimer's dementia or other you know, forms of, of dementia have been defined for well over 100 years in one way or another. Now, when you look the diagnoses of dementia and i'm sure there's people here who've you know taken loved ones to to memory clinics and to have a diagnosis what you'll recognize in the diagnosis of dementia is that there is nothing in that which measures anything actually happening in the brain what we call biomarkers it talks about memory symptoms it talks about functional impact but it doesn't talk about the brain disease which underpins it but in the 1990s we saw the scientific breakthrough that gave us the ability to measure what was happening in the brain through neuroimaging and also through spinal fluid. In essence, since over the last 20 or 30 years, Alzheimer's disease itself could actually be measured. So we didn't necessarily have to rely on the symptoms that emerged, the memory symptoms, the language difficulties, or the functional impact. We could actually measure the disease directly. And again, to go back to analogies, we don't, for instance, describe cancers as pain disorders or nausea disorders. We describe them as cancers and we measure the disease by looking at, you know, doing biopsies, etc. And we could, if we were minded to, do the same thing now with Alzheimer's disease. So just want to quickly run through some of the things that we're able to do, and I'm not going to go into any detail, but through brain scanning, for instance, we can pick up an area of the brain called the medial temporal lobe. And I hope you can see my arrow, which is this little area here. Um, and as you can see, as the disease progresses, these are different patients, but as the disease progresses, the, the brain shrinks. And one area which is involved in memory, which shrinks in particular more than any other, is this medial temporal lobe. And you can see it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. I often muse about why I find it challenging to describe to my colleagues sometimes that Alzheimer's is a brain disease. When you look at advanced Alzheimer's disease in this individual, you can see the incredible reduction in the volume, the size of the brain relative to somebody much healthier and earlier in the course of the disease. We can also measure how good the blood flow is in the brain by the end effect of poor blood flow, and this is what are called, what's called white matter disease. And these white areas around the black areas, the black areas are called ventricles, they're the areas of space, if you like, filled with fluid inside the brain, which is perfectly normal. But then you get these areas of white matter disease where the blood flow hasn't been so good, and that can also generate symptoms as well. And there's a very close relationship between blood flow and Alzheimer's pathology. We can measure blood flow more directly through looking at the amount of glucose, FDG is uh, fluoxydioxyglucose, uh, and that is a marker of, of the metabolism, the blood flow, the activity of the brain, and that is also affected in Alzheimer's disease. And there's other ways of measuring this in MRI. So we've got these incredible technologies that can measure the structure of the brain, can measure the blood flow and the function of the brain. And this is my favorite photo. We've even got ways now of taking a very normal brain scan that you could easily get in any hospital in Edinburgh, Glasgow, Aberdeen, or elsewhere. 
And through processing, through editing, if you like, we can actually create what's called a neuronal connectivity map. This is actually called DTI, diffusion tensor imaging. And that measures the connections, the neuronal connections between certain areas of the brain. So we can not, not only see how the structure of the brain is, but how well different regions of the brain are talking to each other. And there may be certain patterns of that being dysfunctional as time goes on, as Alzheimer's progresses. And probably one of the greatest advances, um, maybe not such a pretty picture, um, is oh, this frozen for some reason. Okay, is actually, if you remember, I said earlier about amyloid and tau, we now have ways to measure directly how much amyloid or tau is in the brain of individuals, be they in health or, or with Alzheimer's disease. So you can build up this incredible picture of structure, of the abnormal proteins of the blood flow, and that can give you a really good indication or should be able to give you a really good indication of, um, of, of, of what's happening in that individual's brain decades before they develop symptoms. The final thing I'll talk about in this section is that we're also um, able, and we have been able for like I say 20 or 30 years, to measure proteins in the spinal fluid. And the spinal fluid also laps around the brain itself and the, 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 um, the waste materials, if you like, and what's happening between the nerve cells uh, through the waste materials that the nerve cells produce can be captured in a spinal tap. And in people with Alzheimer's disease, you get a very different profile of proteins in the spinal fluid uh, compared to people who don't have Alzheimer's. So again, this is knowledge, this is information, this is early detection. So as I said at the beginning, I think the world until very recently has been looking at these neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's disease, through what I describe as the peephole of dementia or the lens of dementia. So you necessarily are trying to understand a very long disease process by only looking at it at the very end stage. And when you do that, and historically, when we didn't have the ability to do the brain scanning or the spinal fluid, we looked at what the brain did rather than what it looked like or what it was doing. Um, and that was why we focused in our memory. But what we're doing now is we're shifting our gaze earlier to the course of disease. And in that regard, we may not have people with any symptoms, any memory problems, any functional problems. So we're gonna to have to rely more heavily on measuring the brain through what we call biomarkers, the brain imaging, the blood testing, and spinal fluid, et cetera. So I think I'm gonna skip through these because they don't add anything more to, to what I was saying earlier, just for the sake of time. But of course, as well as measuring what's actually happening in the brain, what people are wanting to know is, well, why did it happen? Why, why did my loved one or why did I have Alzheimer's disease? Why did it start to develop? So we need to understand not only what the brain looks like and what it's doing, but also what led to the disease in the first place. And that's, of course, looking at risk factors. Now, I mentioned at the very beginning that age is the number one risk factor, but there's lots of other things that might increase or decrease your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Diet, alcohol, smoking, other medical conditions like diabetes, etc. So it's a very complex interplay. It's not a, a sort of a one-on-one -on -one situation where one thing, you know, will definitely cause Alzheimer's disease. It's a collection, an accumulation of risks and accumulation of mitigating factors as well that may reduce your risk. As well, of course, things that we can't do anything about, so-called unmodifiable risk factors, like we can't choose who our family are, for instance, who our parents were, and we can't you know, change our genetic code. We might be able to deal with the consequences of our genetic code, but we can't actually change it. So this is something that we think about a lot in terms of how, we, how we're going to run clinical uh, services in the future. Because what, what I, what I remember, one of the driving forces for me in the PREVENT project about five, ten years ago was seeing a patient when I used to work down in London, actually the son of, of, of a couple of patients of mine, who after a very thorough assessment, after being worried about his own brain health, said, said at the end of it, well, what's my risk and what can I do about it? And I had to be honest with him and said, look, I really can't tell you exactly what your risk is. I can't tell you it's 43% of developing dementia in 10 years time. And he said, well, you know, let's work on that. Let's do something about it. And as it happened, he, he, he made a big philanthropic donation into the, initiating the PREVENT program that, that Matt described earlier. And what we realized we needed to do is collect huge amounts of data and experimental studies to then be able to use in the real world on risk factors, on biomarkers, on cognition or how the brain articulates itself, you know, that we can observe through cognitive testing and what have you. 
but also how these things change over time, the fourth dimension being time. And these, these are the models, these are the data, sorry, that we will collect, we will model, probably using things like machine learning and artificial intelligence to create risk prediction algorithms. So just before we go to the break, um, I think about this in, 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 a, in a reasonably s simplistic way. A model of brain function, cognition, what does the brain do? I mean, the brain does everything in a sense that makes us who we are. It senses what's happening in the outside world. It assimilates that knowledge, it processes it, and then it creates an action to react to whatever we've sensed, be it an emotional sense or a physical sense or a, you know, whatever it may be. Now, a marker of this brain function is our cognitive abilities. You know, how well can we remember? How well can we speak? How well can we recognize? And these were testable. Because they were testable, they, became, they, they developed some degree of primacy in terms of our way of describing uh, uh, dementia. And they became known as memory disorders or cognitive disorders. But that was such a limited concept of what the brain can do. It can do so much more. And then we think about what can we actually see inside the brain. If we can use our imaging, we can look, like I said earlier, and I showed you some slides in this. We can see its structure. We can see how it operates, how it functions. And then we can look at things like, um, you know, is there amyloid in it? Is there tau? Is it inflamed? These pathological changes all through brain imaging or spinal fluid. We've also got some work that we're doing with colleagues in Edinburgh looking at the back of the eye to see if there's changes in the back of the eye which correlate. And one of the most exciting things that I haven't got a slide on here is we've also got some really exciting work going on about changes in speech and dialogue and how we use words and how we communicate with each other. Because there's probably things in the way we speak that are very early markers of the brain not working so well. And I do actually sometimes you know, worry or, 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 or get excited, depending on what mood I'm in, that one day we might be talking to Alexa and that Alexa will say, you know, you know uh, you should go and see your doctor because they'll, she will have picked up a change in our speech pattern that may be indicative and quite specific for an early Alzheimer's disease. Now, if there's something you can do about that, and I believe there are things you can do about it, that's obviously a good thing, uh, not, 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 not a terrifying thing. So just before we go to the break, I thought I'd, 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 I'd do some cognitive testing with the audience now because I can't expect you to sort of you know, shout out your answers. But if you were seen in a memory clinic, um, or you took somebody, um, a loved one, to a memory clinic today, you would get a series of cognitive tests done. And those cognitive tests would involve things like being asked, what is the date today? And if I held up a set of keys, what is this called? And then ask you maybe to do a little bit of, this is actually a test of, of attention, not so much um, of calculation. But starting at 100, I want you to take seven away and keep taking seven away from the answer you give until I ask you to stop. And everybody in this audience is probably going, you know, 93, 86, 79, 72, 65, 58. Quite easy, not too difficult, not too challenging. You might drop one or two points on, on these scales. But the problem is then, if we use these types of tests for early detection in people in their 40s and 50s, everyone's gonna score really highly and it's not gonna be very informative. So if you remember back to when I was showing you those pictures of brain scans, I mentioned this area of the medial temporal lobe, which atrophies very early in the course of disease. We know that from, our, from the research that we've been doing locally. And one of the areas inside the medial temporal lobe is something called the hippocampus. And we know from scientific experiments over many years, the hippocampus is very sensitive to amyloid and tau pathology. It's very early affected in the course of the disease. We now know with advanced imaging techniques, the, the hippocampus is then broken up into subfields. So there's smaller parts of the hippocampus, which are now only sort of, you know, you know, tenths of millimeters in size, but we can image these and we can collect information on them. And what we can do even further down is we can actually see what these different subfields do. And what they do is we found out is they're very, very important in uh, visuospatial function where we are in space and how we can represent our, the world around us is what these, um, uh, the hippocampus really helps us do. So rather than asking someone what the date is, we've derived tests, cognitive tests of visuospatial function. Now this is one of those tests, it's called the Four Mountains Test. And everybody on this webinar will be looking at this uh, image, this, this, this landscape of four mountains. And I want you to try and remember this. This is what we call 
allocentric visuospatial memory. Allocentric because you're actually outside of the scene, egocentric if you're in the scene. So if you're trying to orientate back to your car in a car park, that's egocentric uh, spatial memory. But if you're outside of a scene and you're watching a view changing, for instance, you're walking around the crater around these mountains, that's called allocentric. So you've got a good chance to look at that. Now I'm going to show you four photos which are the same scene, but from a different perspective. And your job is to tell me which one is the same scene. I can almost hear all the gas from all over Scotland of people trying to do this. And this is really tough. And this is a good marker of hippocampal function, of those hippocampal place, place and grid cells working. Now, the good news is, of course, that some of us are really bad at this all the time. I mean, I look at this and every time I look at it, I cannot get it right. But if I were to change and get even worse at doing this, and this is a more complicated one, then that would be more, perhaps more indicative of there being a problem. So just to summarize, we've spent the last 100 years describing Alzheimer's disease through how it's observable at its very late stages, primarily through memory and cognitive function. For the last 30 years, we've been able to, to we've been able to measure this brain disease um, through neuroimaging, through spinal fluid, and perhaps through more sensitive cognitive testing. My argument is that now that we have that ability, what we should be doing is moving our clinical services and our research findings into clinical practice. And that's what the second part of this is, and this is about Brain Health Scotland. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, and I think Matt, you may have some questions and we can pick things up after that. I do, Craig, that, um, that was excellent, thank you. Um, I, I've got one, um, one sort of theme that, that I want to question you on. I think you might, you might touch upon it in the next section or go into it. Before I do, um, I, I should have said at the start, that we have a Q&A session um, whereby um, you can type in questions um, in private. They'll be seen by me um, and I will pose those questions um, to Craig. Um, so if you have questions you want to ask while I'm um, asking Craig mine, um, please type them in. I've already got um, a couple that have come in um, just now. Um, but before I get to them, Craig, I, I find the, the preventative element of this extremely interesting but um, there, it struggles or there's, there doesn't seem to be a way in which you can achieve what you want to achieve without spending a lot of money and requiring a lot of people to go into hospital because the this notion of dementia and these um, signs when, when one has it are ones that um, trigger the visit to the doctor or visit yeah. to the hospital or um and there's been a lot of education about these signs so that people especially in scotland you know we're not very um willing generally to go to the doctor sure. once you've got these signs i need to do something about it i need to get there what you're advocating almost is declassify it as dementia it's a brain degenerative disease it happens at different stages we need to identify it earlier all makes sense but the problem seems to be how do we identify it earlier other than getting everyone in to have a brain scan yeah. or yeah. have um, fluid taken from their spine and i think the what i'm interested in and which may be the second section is there must be a big education piece around yeah. about this there must be and um, so what you were talking about in terms of Alexa is, is really interesting because that's probably where Amazon are wanting to go with, with a lot of what they do. But um, how, how do you reconcile all of that and the, bearing in mind the silent period as, as a silent period? No, I think that's, a, that's a, an incredibly good observation and question because I think this is something that we, as you can imagine, we think about a huge amount is you know, getting these research findings into, into the public domain we need to have a series of conversations with the public to number one, um, you know, illustrate that what we're, what we're doing is going to make a difference. You know, there's a reason to have this identified early. Um, and that, I think a lot of that is a, is a conversation, not for a doctor to tell a person 
why this is helpful. It's to, you know, people have their own agency, they have their own motivations for doing things. What we need to do is make sure, make them know that there is a, there is a, an accurate test out there. You know, that coming back to my, 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 my patient's son, you know, what, what, what's my risk and what can I do about it? I mean, I took the view that I, I want to dedicate my career to being able to answer that question. How, how, once we have that ability, then isn't like you say, there's another series of conversations to have to how we use it for, for preventing dementia. Um, in a very simple way, and I will come back to it in the second part of the presentation, but in a very simple way, for instance, you know, that, that sun illustrates the, the, our, if you like, and I, I use the term with great caution, our market, because people who have a strong family history who are in their 30s and their 40s are already beginning to worry about their brain health. And already we know that from surveys we've done. And those are the people who, who are actually beginning to go up to their GPs, at least into primary care, and say, is there anything I can be doing? So I think the the, the dementia, um, you know, awareness has had a, I think, a beneficial effect on a, a raising brain health awareness in younger people. And I think if you've got a strong family history, you've got a history of head injury, you've got diabetes, talk about some of the risk factors, you might then say, well, you know, I, I need a checkup, I need a brain checkup. And how that translates into what actually happens in the clinic, I can talk about in the next section. So it doesn't, you know, we don't, we're never going to brain scan 1 million people in Scotland. Uh, we're not going to screen people. What we're going to do is, is, is do this kind of, you know, stepped approach to, to trying to detect the disease at the earliest stage. Okay. Now that, um, I think that's interesting. Your analogy with cancer is, is, is very hmm. appropriate, isn't it? It's because the breast cancer gets reduced because that, that is something that you can... Yeah. Of assess or, or, or determine and you, you mentioned screening one of the questions was should we be introducing a screening program well i mean i i i think not definitely not now <laughs> um but i but i'd like to think that in the future we will be thinking about alzheimer's disease the same way we think about um heart disease and stroke and i'm sure most people over the age of 50 on this call have had their blood pressure checked now, why do you do that? You don't do that because blood pressure hurts. You know, uh, blood pressure is a risk factor for stroke and heart disease. Now, it might be that in 10, 15 years' time, we have a blood test for amyloid, and we've got treatments for amyloidosis that prevent you getting Alzheimer's disease, just like, you know, treating hypertension prevents stroke. So when it gets to that stage, yeah, let's screen everybody <laughs> over a certain age because that's where we'll pick up these earliest stages of disease. Now, there's obviously a lot of science and a lot of epidemiology needs to be done before that, but that has to be the goal mm. that we get to a point where as the whole public accept blood pressure and getting their lipid levels checked, they don't even think about it just it's because it's such compelling evidence that if you manage high blood pressure, you reduce the chance of a stroke or a heart attack. Let's get to that point with Alzheimer's disease. That'd be lovely. Then we can do the screening programs. Yeah. Not now. There's a bit of the thing. Is still a bit of evidence to, to generate before we get to that point. But that's certainly what we'd be aiming for. That makes a lot of sense. And we, we've actually got lots of questions, um, and I will uh, ask three more. Um, uh, if you've asked a question and Craig's not been able to answer it, we will um, get back to you. Definitely. Yeah. Delighted to. Yeah. Um, one very interesting question. Um, you talked about almost the the five year moving on and um, point um, and you showed the graph at the start but a question um that's come in is um is there a rapid onset dementia that essentially goes from very minor outward symptoms to a final stage with only within a few months yeah yeah well i think that, that's a really really good question actually because in some way there's a, uh, a risk of over answering it there is a bias where we see people in memory clinic who probably have, if you like, a normal course of illness. So you have a, a belief that the, the, the dementia phase of illness lasts about seven years. But if there is a more rapidly progressing form, which there possibly is, they might not get to the point of being seen in a memory clinic. If that makes any sense. They might sort of bypass that and go from being healthy into a, dare say, a nursing home very rapidly. But I think that's rare. I think to be fair, most people who um, do get an Alzheimer's dementia diagnosis have a kind of a, 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 a more sort of standard uh, trajectory. But my argument would be that no matter how rapid your, your journey through the dementia stages of illness are, you've probably got 
at least years of a, of a silent period before that. Um, there won't be a rapidly progressing Alzheimer's disease, even if there might be a rapidly progressing Alzheimer's dementia. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, so the, the degeneration of the brain doesn't happen rapidly. Correct. But the clinical syndrome might. And one of the reasons that people's clinical syndrome might progress rapidly is because they have other things like a stroke or infections or, or concurrent medical illness. But the disease itself is probably going to be measured over over years, maybe even um, probably decades. So even in those people who'd have a more rapid decline when they get a dementia, if they were to get it, they would we'd still be able to detect early stages of disease before symptoms develop. Okay, penultimate question, um, a very interesting one from, from one of our Buddhist colleagues, Isabel. Are the indicators of neurodegeneration similar in different countries or I suppose in different races? Is everyone uh, brain the same or? Probably, <laughs> probably. And I think there's, a, again, a fantastic question because I think, and I'll, I'll, I'll touch on this towards the end actually, there's an assumption that they're similar from the evidence we have, but guess where all the evidence comes from? Yeah. You know, it comes from North America, Japan, you know, uh, Australasia and Europe. So although there are populations within those communities, unfortunately, a lot of those populations don't come forward for clinical research. That's a whole nother problem that we have. Um, so we're making assumptions that there are similar trajectories of decline. But one of the things we need to do, I do talk about in the next section, is try and work out how we can, you know, look at these data from across the world and get data from different groups and organizations and, and we do a lot of work with um with gates ventures and the gates bill and melinda gates foundation to try and achieve that over the next sort of five or ten years so it's a very good question and something we're on but we're making assumptions and that's dangerous yeah okay last question for i'll let you move on to the the, the next section um and uh, Egocentric was very apt, given there's probably a lot of lawyers watching um, this. But, <laughs> are you, um, which and maybe, do right? maybe doctors as well. We could <laughs> yeah, be a bit egocentric too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which was the right answer for the spatial awareness test? I don't know. Um, <laughs> oh, hang on a minute. Let me see if we can do it again. Um, I think it's. I think it's D. I don't know if, if Neil Fullerton, who's one of my associates with Brain Health Scotland, is on the call, he can ping me a text and tell me which one it is, or he can, he can, he can post it because he's very good at this. I can never remember it. I think it's D. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. So I see I've, I've, we've, 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 we've got 15 minutes left. So I think I'll, 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 I'll try and, I'm not going to rush through it, but I'll, I'll certainly, this section wasn't ever going to be as long as the first section. But, but, but as Matt said, one of the roles that I have now is as director of Brain Health Scotland. Um, and this is a huge honor for me. This is something that we've set up with Alzheimer's Scotland um, in negotiation with the Scottish government, including direct conversations with the first minister, really going back over two, two and a half years. And those conversations were, were around basically what I've just been saying to you already, that we think we're really poised and ready to take a lot of the research evidence into practice. Um, and she and the Scottish government um, really did recognize the value of this and, and dare say it, the credibility in our argument. So Brain Health Scotland is, is, is situated from a governance perspective and for a whole other uh, series of reasons within Alzheimer Scotland. So it's almost like a branch of Alzheimer Scotland uh, sponsored and supported by Scottish government. And this was our, our, our vision, is that from 2020, um, Brain Health Scotland will deliver a reduction of incidence rates of dementia year on year, so that we all benefit from the lowest rates in the world. And, and I emphasize all benefit, because um, equity uh, of access to what we do in Brain Health Scotland is, is very much at the forefront of all, of all our thinking. So like I said, it's established, officially launched on the 1st of April 2020. Um, we've got five years of funding from Scottish Government for our sort of core team, if you like. We've already brought in um, some grant funding from philanthropy and from some commercial partners as well. Um, and like I said, it's embedded within Alzheimer's Scotland. The core team at the moment is myself as a director, uh, Henry Simmons, who many of you know will be the, is a deputy director, our executive lead, Anna Borthwick, and project lead, Neil Fullerton. Uh, but we are growing the team 
uh, at, at the moment uh, on the basis of this funding. But what we don't want to do is have a big sort of monolithic structure. What we want to do is, is collaborate with the existing strengths that, that are across Scotland and universities and the NHS and you know, food industry, leisure industry, legal industry. We want to build collaborations to achieve our objectives. And those objectives are that, that we, as we say, we'll reduce the incidence of dementia by 10% every five years. And we calculate on the back of the envelope, this will be multi, multi billion pounds of savings to the economy uh, if we are to achieve this over this time course. We want everyone to access brain health services, and I'm going to describe the, the, the vision for those in a second. Uh, we're going to produce next month a research strategy for brain health and dementia research, which would be the first in the world to actually have a specific uh, brain health and dementia research strategy. And we'll also have a, a, a Brain Health Scotland strategy, clinical strategy, uh, next year, which we'll review uh, every five years. And you know, I'm sure there's some business-minded folk on the call here. We don't want to be reliant on government uh, for the duration, so we want to create financial autonomy and sustainability uh, within two years. Now, it's a complicated slide, so apologies. There's some even worse slides coming up. It gets a lot worse than this. But this is just to illustrate one key point, and that is that Brain Health Scotland has to operate against across three domains, research, informatics and health sciences, and the clinical arena, be that public health, primary care, or the secondary care setting where I work as a psychiatrist. So it's only by bringing together all of those existing domains and the specific parts of those, so things like the cohort studies that we have, the joint dementia research, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that will work effectively. And this is the argument we made to the First Minister and government, is that Scotland actually probably has all the jigsaw pieces already in the box. It's just needing somebody to take them out of the box and put the picture together. And that's what Brain Health Scotland is, is, is seeking to do. I want to talk about brain health clinics in a little bit more detail. So two or three years ago, um, I convened a meeting um, of, if you like, the great and the good uh, of clinical academics, uh, plus the charities, Alzheimer's Society, Alzheimer's Research UK, and of course, Alzheimer's Scotland hosted the meeting in Edinburgh to really sort of drill down on a lot of what we've been talking about already, about you know, early detection and risk profiling. And we produced a paper, peer-reviewed publication called the Edinburgh Consensus. And this was kind of a, like the kind of the intellectual foundation for Brain Health Scotland, where we, we got a group of, like I say, very well-minded and well-informed people, clinical academics together to come up with the, the plan of action, if you like, what we needed to do to make the, the NHS um, better, and in this case for disease-modifying therapies, but the, 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 the themes apply to risk reduction as well as drugs. Um, and taking from that, you know, we, we, we crystallized the, the, the brain health clinic approach. So if you remember back to what I was saying earlier about risk factors, you know, what we need to do is we need to work across that slide. If you were really eagle eyed, you'll have seen that different risk factors probably had different impacts on us at different stages in our life. So some things like being overweight is a risk factor for dementia in midlife but it's actually protective when you get into your 70s, your 80s. So we need to make sure that we're using um, you know, risk reduction strategies at the right point in the individual's time. So education, for instance, is gonna have its biggest potency, its biggest impact on well-being, brain health in school children. So we need to work with you know, the educational authorities, with the schools, primary and secondary, and indeed the universities, to optimize the opportunities for education. That's a more public health approach. Then that merges into brain health services, where you actually maybe start doing something a little bit more, um, less passive, more active around finding maybe people we, we have experience of, you know, doing some, you know, memory testing in church hall, community groups, etc. Uh, and being able to then offer either, you know, triage onto a more uh, detailed assessment or just some simple advice in those settings to more individual or small groups about mindfulness, about you know, diet, about nutrition, about exercise, et cetera. So there's public health and there's more sort of targeted like group health. And then ultimately there's individual health at the brain health clinic. Primary prevention is where you stop the disease ever developing. So the example that has vaccination. Secondary prevention is when the disease has started, but maybe it's in its infancy and you stop it getting to a, a later stage. Memory clinics, are very good at diagnosing dementia and then providing post-diagnostic support. 
What they're not so good at is identifying these early stages of neurodegenerative disease. So we've kind of considered these, sep these clinics should be separate from memory clinics. Now just quickly, I don't want to step through this in any great detail, but this would be the approach. We would take this individual, so that this 60 year old gentleman on the left hand bar, um, we have all this wonderful data, we can access, access all these incredible tests, and we run the data through the machine, we have the algorithms all set up from all of our research studies and previous data we've collected, and the computer tells the clinician that that 60-year-old gentleman has a 73% 73, 73 risk of developing dementia in 10 years' time. And it's accurate, okay, because we've, we've got the numbers, we've done the science. And we also know that what's driving that individual's risk is his lifestyle, his genetic data, his diabetes, the fact it's not very well controlled, and there's already the emergence maybe of some amyloid. So with that individual, the personalized prevention plan is, if you lose some weight and we control your diabetes, then you should reduce your risk. So because it's the NHS, his next appointment's 10 years later, he comes back to clinic, we reassess him, and lo and behold, the diabetes is better controlled, he's lost the weight, Biology may have accumulated and the age has obviously gone up, but even when we run the numbers then, we still find the 10 year risk has gone down to 51%. He then comes back, we then decide, well, actually, we've got these anti amyloid drugs, which we probably will have in a few years' time. Let's put you on a course of those. Lo and behold, maybe it comes back later, 10 years later, diabetes got a bit worse, weight's still good, biology's been knocked down by the drug. Now the computer says your risk of again developing dementia in 10 years is 37%. This guy is not going to get dementia syndrome. He would have done had we done nothing at the age of 60, but he's not going to because of what we've done with the personalized prevention plan, which included risk factor modification as well as pharmacological intervention. So what we've tried to do is take all of that science, all of that evidence, all of the experience we have in terms of the NHS and clinical setups and data and inf health informatics and data sciences and put it into what we call the SEED program, which is the Scottish Early Alzheimer's Disease Dementia Program. Okay. And this will be our program for early disease detection. And it's launched, it will be launching in the new year, in effect. The key elements are in place. We've been doing some of the pilot work in Edinburgh. We've been generating our knowledge, our understanding where the, where the problems may lie. And through 2021, there'll be a national scale up involving multiple stakeholders, as you'll see in the next slide. Um, and core to the SEED program is the establishment of these brain health clinics. So this is my worst slide that I've ever created in my life. But this is the template that we're going to be working on within Brain Health Scotland. So I don't expect any of you to copy this down or note it, because I've got a summary slide in a second. But I just want to pick up a couple of things. Number one, equity of access. Within all of what we do, equity of access will be absolutely paramount. It won't be an afterthought. We know that the risk factors for dementia accumulate in people from more, more deprived socioeconomic backgrounds. So we need to make sure that when we establish these clinics and these services, we do so for the population who are going to benefit from them most. The other point I want to pick up is consent to the Scottish Brain Health Register. We need to make sure that all of the data we collect from people coming through these clinics can help inform the algorithms for the future. So we get better and better and better and better and better at risk prediction as the years go by, because we've got more experience that we collect through our data sets. So Matt, this is probably answering your question from earlier in some ways. This is, this is a seed program, as you would see it if you were a patient. You come to us, well actually not a patient, a person, an individual. You come to us because you're worried. We will do some simple cognitive tests and ask some questions about your health and risk factors. You might do it over the phone, you might do it online. It'll be very simple, it'll be very low friction. If we think, because we've got the data, we've got the algorithms, you need further testing. Within the same service, we might do a blood test for your genetic uh, profile. You'd have an interview with a nurse, you'd have a physical examination, and that would build up this risk profiling. If we think you need further testing, then you may come up, or you would come up and get a brain scan. You'd be seen by a doctor, you might get some CSF te testing, and that would detect the disease. So of the thousand people who go through step one, maybe only five come to step three, okay? And then of course, at the end of step three, or step four, we discuss these results with you, you your specific risk, and work with you in a personalized prevention plan. And of course, the hope would be that you end up with the, like the individual who doesn't get dementia because they, they manage it well. Now in Edinburgh, 
really over the last two or three months and actually since COVID and we have to do all of our clinical assessments now over the phone which has made this really tough but we've already started to triage patients who refer to the memory clinic and if they've got very mild symptoms or the GP suspects there's a problem going on but they don't think it's a dementia or will be or is a dementia currently then we see them in, in, in the brain health clinic pathway and we try as far as possible to do all of those things that I've just described but it is made hard by the fact that we're having to do things over the phone. So I think just to finish, um, as well as the brain health clinics, we also have to think about how we affect change at a population level. Again, I like to keep things simple. Good brain health will build resilience and help counteract damage if you've got good blood flow, if there's good nutrients in that blood, and it's got a good supply of oxygen in the blood. You keep your levels of stress to a good level. Stress is good at a certain level. It's really bad. Uh, higher levels and good education learning and stimulation and the best way to stimulate your brain is to have a blether to go out with your friends you know to be in social certain situations so if you think about a young girl um in scotland um she may not have had the best start in life so it pushes her towards a not so healthy brain she may have some comorbidities she might have asthma for instance her lifestyle her nutrition isn't great and you know you can't do anything by your family history, but it pushes her to the left. And of course, what we seek to do is, you know, push that individual to the right by, like this gentleman, this might be your, your middle-aged man in Lycra, who does all the right things, he, he's out cycling, he's eating well, he's been well educated. So he might actually fake things to the right. He might have a healthier brain than was otherwise predetermined. And it's not too late when you get into later life. Of course, age is a major risk factor. But this gentleman with multiple comorbidities, a poor lifestyle, um, and maybe low levels of education, and no longer involved in any sort of university of third age or ongoing learning, is having a not so healthy brain. So Brain Health Scotland, clinicians, primary care, help with education, suggest about lifestyle, nutrition, et cetera. So you can see how at the individual level, managing risk factors can improve um, your brain health. Now, what we want to do, of course, is work at a population level. We know that Scotland, in pockets, has some fantastic education, nutrition, lifestyle. But we also know there's large areas of this country where lifestyle and nutrition isn't great, where the rates of comorbidities like diabetes and hypertension and stroke and heart disease are way too high relative to other countries. So what we'd want to do is work with our public health experts or, and say, can we shift this? Can we shift Scotland as a whole to the right? Because if you do that, you can have less individuals coming forward. And I've added to that, these bars, the one thing that's probably specific to brain health and that's social integration and connections. And I think it's very poignant that we talk about that now because of lockdown. We, you know, there is a concern and a worry that some of the things that are happening now, which are actually disconnecting society other than through virtual means, might have longer term consequences. Uh, on brain health if we're not able to, to socially integrate. So I'm just going to finish with this slide. Uh, one of the things that we were asked about earlier was about the international scene. So we're a big player, dare I say, on the international scene. And on the right are all the various projects that we're part of, this kind of group that's forming uh, at a very high and senior level, actually coordinated very much by, 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 by Bill Gates, uh, his group. Um, and we're sharing ideas, we're sharing knowledge. We also have a very good nascent uh, discussion going with Alzheimer's Disease International that we spoke to them just yesterday about how Brain Health Scotland can be used as a kind of a test bed to then talk to other countries in the world like Jamaica, Nigeria, Kenya, who may have other perspectives on this and other expertise in this, which we can learn from and we can share ideas. So this is Scotland's place, if you like, in a global family of initiatives around brain health. So this is my last slide. So I think what we did with the First Minister, with the Scottish Government, with academic colleagues here is we've, we've really made the argument that Scotland as a nation has the capacity to substantially improve brain health at an individual and a population level. The research power, unique information in ecosystem through the NHS and the coordination of health that's possible through the NHS can be brought together to address this global challenge through the work of Brain Health Scotland. Uh, in some ways, you could argue that Scotland is small enough to make a big difference to brain health and dementia across the world. So I'll stop there, Matt. 
and uh, have maybe a couple of minutes of questions before we have to close. Yeah, definitely. I think I can talk with you about this for another hour. It's incredibly interesting, Craig. Um, I think the the project itself um, it is is fantastic. What what was going through my head when you you referenced in a couple of slides back? Um, come and see us, and it's understanding in a very practical level. Where, where does the process begin? I'm thinking us as brain health clinic. Do, mm. Does the process begin if you are worried? And I guess that's the education point as well. How do you know you should be worried? But um, if you are worried, do you see your GP first, who then will make the referral to the brain health clinic, or you know, what's do they go straight? Do you go straight to brain health clinic? What's yeah. and how do you see that in the future as part of Brain Health Scotland? So I think the the you know, what we hope over next over the next year is to set up five pilot sites in Scotland, which will run brain health clinics. So there might not be a brain health clinic in in your locality. Um, and we need to make sure we're communicating through all of our channels to the primary care physicians of where these pilot sites are. And, you know, some GPs will be advantaged in being near one, others may, may, maybe not so. Um, but we need to learn. So we need to start off this cautiously. I don't think we're ready to, to launch this as a national program. I think we need to prove cost effectiveness. We need to smooth out some wrinkles, et cetera. Um, but yes, I mean, the, 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 point, the point of entry ideally would be the primary care physician. Um, and, and ultimately you'd want to run in effect your brain health clinic in the primary care setting. This should be a GP led and managed program as it is with heart disease now. I mean, it's, it's very occasion that people come up to see the specialist. Now a lot, of, a lot of the early work is done in primary care. So, you know, what I've, what I've shown you is, is, is not a vision in the sense of this isn't gonna happen. This is, this is, this is happening but it's going to be very much a stepped approach. Um, and I think we need to make sure through Brain Health Scotland and through our partners that we're making sure we communicate this in a hopeful and optimistic way. But what we don't want to do is, is give people false hope that somehow this clinic is, is open in a neighbourhood near them when that might be a year or two away. So I think we've got a responsibility to make sure that we're at this kind of early stage. Okay. Uh, it, it puts me in mind of the 1980s films where if you complete a quiz the CIA gets in touch maybe that can be the way in which you, you know when to go to the brain health clinic but um, the, <laughs> big brother is watching definitely yeah, um, the, I think look, looking at time um, I mean, I've got one more question um, and, and then I think we can give everyone the correct answer for the, the, the image um, <laughs> do you think we will live in a dementia free world yes Yes. And, and, I, I, I actually, I think I, I got asked that question in my inaugural and I'll, I'll give you the exact answer I gave then. Um, my dad is 80, probably not. I'm 51, possibly. My son's 20, my daughter's 17, definitely. A great way to finish a fabulous um, presentation, Craig. And an even better way for those that got it right, it was the bottom right hand. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Craig, um, thank you from, from me and from everyone at Brodie's and, and from everyone who's um, listened to a, a, an excellent, informative um, and interesting session. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for all your support. Really appreciate it. Pleasure. All right. Thank you all.